Good morning, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment as people continue to file in. And also, welcome to everyone joining us online. of Housing Pathways at Homes Melbourne and it is my privilege to be your facilitator for today's discussion. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's event. And we acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to live in sacred and spiritual relationships with the land. And the spiritual homelessness of many people experienced through their separation from traditional land, culture, family and kinship groups. And that sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Before I introduce our panellists, I'll run through some housekeeping and provide a quick contextual setting for today's discussion. First, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the generous support and sponsorship of National Shelter for this major concurrent session, and thank Emma Greenholch, uh, who's here today as CEO. I'd also like to acknowledge the Australian Local Government Association and the Council of Capital City Lord Mayors for arranging our involvement in this event, and in particular, Deborah Wilkinson and Wisdy Chastel in bringing today's session together. And of course, we'd like to thank Ahuri and Homelessness Australia for the opportunity to participate in the conference itself. This session is being streamed and recorded and will be available for all delegates to view after the conference. We'll be employing a semi-structured format today and we'll be inviting questions from the floor in the second part of this session and via the QA app for those joining us online. You can apparently locate this to the right of your screen. For those in the room, if you wish to ask a question towards the second half of the session, please put up your hand, wait for one of the microphones, and just make sure you ask it clearly and plainly so everyone online can clearly understand the question being asked. And of course, you yourself can use the QA app online. So, some context. Given Australia's population distribution, the greatest number of people at risk of homelessness are living in greater capital cities, in both central and suburban locations. Local governments are increasingly responding and implementing programs to deliver more affordable housing and responding to all forms of homelessness. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed many vulnerabilities in cities and towns right across urban Australia. Australia responded well with all levels of government working together to house and support our homelessness communities during this difficult period. It's not over. In local communities right across Australia, people are experiencing acute housing stress, from rough sleeping to severely overcrowded accommodation and rental stress. Australian local governments have historically occupied an ambiguous position when it comes to responding to homelessness. Councils do not hold the funding and policy levers to institute reform or redesign entire specialist service systems. However, and despite this, councils across Australia not only now play a critical role within local homelessness service systems, but often lead efforts to coordinate local services, advocate for housing and homelessness reform at all levels of government, and fund a myriad of invaluable local programs and projects. As we heard at yesterday's plenary session, local governments are now very much in the frame when we discuss national state homelessness responses. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our panel today who will tackle this topic. We are joined remotely by Councillor Linda Scott, an experienced board director previously serving as the first female chair of the Local Government Association of New South Wales, and is currently serving as president of the Australian Local Government Association, ALGA. ALGA represents Australia's 537 local governments. Linda was elected unopposed as ALGA's president in 2020, having served as vice president since 2018 and a member of the ALGA board since 2017. 
Linda is also currently serving as a councillor at the City of Sydney and formerly served as Deputy Lord Mayor. Before I throw to Linda, I'd also like to introduce our panellists in the room. Lauren Grant is the Team Leader of Social Planning and Reconciliation at the City of Adelaide. Leanne Mitchell, Manager of Community Strengthening and Social Planning, Greenbank City Council in Victoria. Celeste Harris, Project Officer, Rough Sleeping, Byron Shire, Council New South Wales. And John Swain, Manager of Homelessness, Social City, City of Sydney, New South Wales. The biographies of all our presenters can be found in the Delegate app if you'd like to read more about them. So enough from me. To kick things off, it is my absolute pleasure to hand over to Linda Scott, and then we'll turn to our panel for discussion. Over to you, Linda. Thanks so much. And I'd also like to start by... Uh, it wouldn't be a uh, COVID conference if we didn't say uh, you're on mute. Good. Well, hopefully somebody can help me out with that. We have some friends in the technical department frantically. Bear with us, Linda. How's that going? Should we give that a go? How's that? You need the other guy. <laughs> We can try to sign. <laughs> yep. Okay, well, look, to avoid any continued awkwardness uh, while, we, while we resolve the technical issues, what we will do, Lauren, is we'll begin to move into some of the discussion and forgive us because I think Lauren was going um, I think Linda was going to provide us some really important framing for our panellists to begin to hook off. But I think in the interest of being able to actually continue to move through the discussion, what we might do is open up some of our um, targeted questions to the panel and then uh, we will obviously turn to Linda once the uh, audio requirements have been resolved. So apologies to everyone for that. And look, I think for us, we've looked to frame today's discussion around a couple of themes. So one of the things is we wanted to look at role. As I said in the outset, local governments occupy a rather ambiguous position when it comes to responding to the issue of homelessness, both at its structural and macro levels, but also in localised service systems. We want to look at some of the trends and issues that cities are confronting. And we're very uh, delighted to welcome colleagues beyond the capital city context, uh, where we begin to look at some of the regional dimensions to this issue. We also want to look at best practice and share some of the things that we value about the work of local government uh, and showcase the areas where we think we're best placed. And the other component is the future focus. What is the role of local government in the emergence of a national housing and homelessness plan? So let's kick it off with a question for you, Leanne. Uh, Leanne is recently, or not so recently, two years pre-COVID, been awarded a, a Churchill Fellowship to look at the very question of the relationship and best practice role for local governments in responding to homelessness. So in your experience, what is the unique role that local government can play when responding to this issue in our community? Thanks, Marty. I hope my microphone is working And I'll just start off by acknowledging the Gunnawong people of the traditional owners of the land we're on, and also the, uh, the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people who are the tradi traditional owners of the land where I uh, work, which is Green Bay Council for Sunshine, the area of um, Melbourne. Um, but I'm probably, uh, it's a bit... Uh, it might just be echoey where we are. Okay. Uh, oh, it's all over, is it? Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> this, is what, this, this is what Ben was saying yesterday on the stage before. It sounds a bit weird here. Anyway, um, so uh, I, I'm going to just go back to actually when Barbani and I worked together at the City of Melbourne some years ago and just reflecting back on 2016 
when homelessness really became very, and, and, on, and, and rough sleeping in the city became really noticeable. And what we found out at that point was that, you know, we had a, a small team of people who were working on welfare responses to homelessness. And all of a sudden, homelessness became a really political situation with a lot of media happening and a lot of people turning to the council, even though we didn't hold the housing levers or the social welfare levers, but people turning to council and asking us, what were we going to do about it? And uh, it, was, it was an interesting situation because there was, obviously there was our, us who, were, who had homelessness in our job titles, but there were also a whole lot of other people who we were working with who didn't have homelessness in their job titles, but played a really important role in responding to homelessness. And so, you know, there were people who were working in the, our park ranges, the people working on the streets, looking after amenity, looking after business. There were so many, so many different elements. And councils really are, you know, 30 businesses in one. And that's really where both the challenges and the opportunities, I think, come up when we think about the role of local government in homelessness. Um, you know, and we didn't have a script for it. We didn't have, we had to go and, um, you know, sort of just find out what was what was happening in other places and, um, you know, work with our colleagues and find out what we could best do in that situation. And I think that draws to one of the, the first points that I'd like to make, which is that, you know, the unique role of council is that we're connectors and councils are often uh, trusted partners in the, in the homelessness space and in lots of spaces, and we're able to bring people together. So what we were able to do was play that role of the connectors, of bringing services together, bringing unlikely partners together, bringing police together, bringing businesses together, and bringing our own colleagues together to work on things um, collectively. Um, councils also are really, you know, are in the unique position of being able to gather data. And I'm sure some of my colleagues here who are particularly are working on the Zero Project will talk a little bit about, about that, about knowing who the people are, who are rough sleeping and knowing how to, to, to bring that together. And service coordination is, was one of the real important levers that we had in a, in a council space. Um, but there are also some other places where councils can really have a, have a role to play that we often don't think about because we're really involved in that prevention space. And in Victoria, we've, we've looked at uh, the, 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 uh, the state government and its action plan acknowledged prevention as a really important element of the homelessness response. And often we don't think about what it is that we can do in that prevention space. We have a lot of people who are working front line with people in the community and you can see things before others do and you often have trusted relationships in those spaces as well that allow you to be able to actually make a difference to take that early intervention and not become as um, Brendan Noddle from the Salvation Army used to often say to us, we don't want to be the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. We want to work on homelessness before it's a crisis. So there's a lot of opportunity in, in that space too. Um, and then of course there's the advocacy and education because one of our biggest challenges as well working in, in local government has often been the community are unsure and often you know afraid of situations, don't know how to how you know what to do. People don't know how to um, you know respond to homelessness. So actually, you know, that, that, that ability to speak to your community, to engage with your community and to be able to bring your community along and also bring government and other services along, other levels of government and other service along is really, is really important. So I won't just leave it at that, Barney, but you know, there's, there's really just, you know, there was one, actually I'll just end on a, a quote because there was a, a mayor in, in Canada in, in a, a place called Halifax who said, when it comes to housing and homelessness, the feds have the money, the province has the jurisdiction, and the cities have the problem. And it's really important that we all work together. Last step, there we go. Thank you, Leanne. Um, now, uh, the, the dynamics that you describe are no doubt in part universal across different parts of Australia, but we also know there's some really important nuances to this dynamic. So we're going to turn to Sydney now, in the city of Sydney, John, and again, to pose the same question. Um, the unique role that the city of Sydney plays in responding to homelessness, and, and I know in particular the relationship that you have with the Victorian government, particularly uh, in the funding of services uh, and the delivery of them directly. 
Could you talk to them? Um, yeah, so I guess with our role, the uniqueness um, for the City of Sydney, so I have a dedicated homelessness unit, so not all local governments have the same luxury. Um, we have a team of seven, it's $2.2 .2 million budget a year. Um, half of that goes to directly to the public space liaison officers that work seven days a week. Um, two dedicated senior project workers that work on street counts, work with mobile voluntary services, work with boarding houses. Um, but we also directly fund specialist homelessness services. So we um, fund two Aboriginal outreach workers um, through two Aboriginal organisations. We also fund a youth outreach worker um, and $200,000 worth of brokerage in that youth outreach program. And we also fund a generalist homelessness service. So it's a very unique setup um, within the city of Sydney. And I think the city is really interesting. I've worked at state level and I've worked and I'm now at local government. And I think, and Leanne touched on it, I think the really unique place the local government is, is we have all these touch points. So where community engages and where we're seeing homelessness. So a good example of that is boarding houses. No one's really in that space. There is some services that work in that space, but our health and building team work in there. And they, they see firsthand when a boarding house um, is nearing a closure. They see like those sort of trends emerging from that space. Libraries, um, you often see a lot of people access libraries where they don't have any other spaces. The rangers, the cleansing and waste teams, um, the parks. So even if a local government council doesn't have a dedicated homeless unit, they have all those touch points. And it's very different from state. State, you don't have that connection to community. And I think for me, that's, that's the uniqueness. And I think that's really where I think going forward um, that local government needs more of a, 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 say, a, say, a say in this space. Um, but yeah, for the city of Sydney, I think we are unique in that space. We've been there a while and I, I feel sort of I think reluctant to talk on behalf of everyone just because we are, yeah, we are, we are fortunate in the funding that we have um, and the advocacy that we play in this space. unique position in relation to responding to the issue of homelessness uh, and also a little bit about your role uh, in that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, in Adelaide, we, we have been in this space for a little while now. We've had a partnership with um, our, what's currently um, South Australian Housing Authority uh, to deliver the Homeless and Vulnerable People Project since 2012 and we've had various other uh, iterations of that prior to that. Um, I think the, the reason why uh, we got into the space and why the, the, the Housing Authority and the State Government approached us to partner in this is that, that as the other, others have said, you know, that unique um, ability we have to connect with our community, we're the closest level of government to our community. We provide a range of community services that um, will have an interface with, with people who are experiencing homelessness. So our libraries, community centres, and you know, in our public realm staff, as John was talking about. So what we can, um, the ability that we have then is to be able to connect those kind of touch points to service <coughs> delivery, uh, build relationships with our local <coughs> service providers, and, um, and be able to make sure that people who um, might, have, might have only just entered into homelessness or who uh, avoid community services that access kind of mainstream community services might be able to still get that support that they need. So we um, we certainly are spending time quiet and we've got one one FT that um, that works in that space uh, in now in my team. And um, that's certainly something that has been a really valuable thing over the years that um, that has been able to build relationships with the sector too. And I think that one of the other key things is not just the, the specialist homes and sector, but also understanding what all sorts of services that operate within our city, and that the city health services and um, and um, Lee, I mentioned police and all the other people who have those touch points, and then connecting all of those people together to be able to um, understand how they are um, doing the collaborative service delivery to the individuals. So um, I really do feel that that is a role that, that we can play. We're not sort of bogged down in the day to day of direct service mm -hmm. delivery and and working with people, but you know we can have that kind of, I guess, broader overview of um, of what's happening um, for for people who are experiencing homelessness in the city and what's happening in the broader sector. Um, in that sort of. Thank you, Lauren.
We're going to turn to, to Byron Shire now, who again has a very different dynamic. I think um, from the, the cold, uh, wintry streets of Melbourne, we look up north uh, to Byron Bay and, and we see Hollywood on the beachfronts, uh, skyrocketing house prices uh, and, and wicked vans dotted along the coast. Uh, but underneath that, we know that that is creating a significant degree of pressure, uh, and pressure that's compounded by a whole range of additional issues, which I won't talk to. Uh, Celeste, thank you for joining us. Um, we reached out to Celeste because we uh, often are within a, a chamber uh, of other capital cities uh, and, and in a community of practice, and we know that the cities well beyond our own that are struggling with this issue and doing excellent work. So Celeste, positioning the role of Byron and Shire and the work that's really triggered or the events that have triggered uh, your particular work in that area. Byron Shire, of course, does have that um, outside perspective of being in the Hollywood of Australia, unfortunately, but of course what's happening is another side is you have um, increasing levels of disadvantage and vulnerability in the population. So we have the second highest number of people experiencing um, crime and homelessness, so speaking up in our community, second only to the city of Sydney. Um, I know that in Sydney, Sydney, we can increase the street count, the numbers are decreasing while ours are increasing. Um, I don't think this year our numbers are almost the same. So it's quite scary for us, um, not to mention that we've just been through multiple flood disasters, so climate change and the impacts of the disasters upon our community are enormous, and it's a whole new space for us to be stepping into as a council. Um, not to mention the huge impacts of COVID and the movements of people out of the cities. Um, so what was a homelessness crisis prior to these events is now an absolute emergency and it's spreading outside of our small council in Byron Shire and across the northern region. Um, so what are we doing about it? Um, I have been in a perspective that I came from in the sector before I moved into local government. So I spent many years yeah. working on the ground in the homelessness sector but also in community advocacy. And I was really part of a lot of the movement to be able to call out to local government to be at the table, actually to all forms of government. So in the regions, um, I think local government is really important because we are the face of government. Um, I know in cities, you probably have a good bit more of the state and federal government. But in regional areas where we are really geographically so far, there's very much need of, um, a perspective from community that we represent the whole of government. Um, there's also some misconceptions about how much power and influence we have, but also if we do have power and influence. And so Byron Shire Council has really stepped into the space in the last, in the last two or three years. It's very new for us. Um, and the way that we've seen our role, um, firstly, I think there has to be a recognition that we, that we had a role to play in the homelessness space, and that we could no longer turn away and push back towards um, the state government, we are deeply embedded in the community in the Byron Shire, so we have a really strong community development focus um, and a team that is out there building those relationships and trust that was needed to allow us to then step into addressing what I would say is the key social issue in our Shire. Um, so the role we've taken has been quite emergent, and I think we talk about the ambiguity of the role of, government, of local government. Um, in a way, I think that's also <coughs> really, really helpful for us because it means that We've been able to look to other local government areas and see what's working really well with local councils. But at the same time, we've been able to really embed ourselves in the community and say, what do we need? Let's have a really place-based response to what's happening because we do have unique experience, um, but there's also much we can learn from other local government areas. So the way that we've done that is um, by stepping into what's a somewhat unique role for local government and becoming what's called the backbone of the organisation. Um, for our work with collaborative effort to end homelessness. So part of the zero work that you'll hear more about, I'm sure, today and across the next few days. Um, so we responded to a call from the community. Um, they said that they saw local government as a somewhat neutral body that was outside a very overloaded sector, that we could step into this space, act as what's called the backbone organisation, which really means bringing together community stakeholders 
across the entire community, including community members, groups, people with lived experience, service providers, and all levels of government to come together to have a shared goal in end homelessness in our community and to do that across all sectors and not to try and uh, break free of the silo that's been happening for, for too long. So we've stepped into that role. It was meant to be an interim role, but it is continuing because the feedback we're getting from the sector and from the community is that it's working quite well. Um, but of course, a lot of the work has been very um, disjointed with the government this year. The other large role that we've taken on around is the local evidence space, as mentioned um, by Leanne. We've worked in partnership with the Anne Street Sleeping Collaboration to be able to roll out a, a binary list of people um, experiencing crime and homelessness in the Byron Shire. Prior to having this binary list, which enabled us to really understand the unique experience of each individual who's sleeping rough, um, but also more broadly, give us a really good. Um, data set to be able to advocate for change for those high levels of government in the whole community. Um, we only really had the street council at the once a year. It wasn't sufficient for us to be able to get the type of spotlight that we need from our region. Um, but it also worked, didn't allow for that cross sector collaboration that we needed to happen to be able to support people more effectively. So we also stepped into the service coordination space and um, we convened a service coordination group that now has. Um, pretty much all service providers that provide support to anyone to people experiencing homelessness coming together using the data from our bioanalysis, which now is 132 people, and more effectively wrap services around those people and work better together. That's what we really asked for. Council was able to reallocate some resources to a role like mine, which is the Buck Seeding Project Officer, and our public space there as an officer to help answer that call for the community to be out there and connect everyone better and start responding to those gaps and then push up towards higher levels of government. Thank you, Celeste. That's, I mean, it's incredible to hear, and particularly in, in such a, an accelerated period of time in three years, in the context of COVID-19, in the context of um, floods uh, and, and obviously the housing pressures in your region. I believe now Councillor Scott is back online. Uh, Councillor Scott, can we uh, just get a quick sound check? Can you hear us and can we hear you? I can hear you perfectly. Hopefully you can hear me. All right, let's, let's just persist with this for a moment and sit in the awkwardness. Um, <laughs> team up top, can we just see if we can get the levels on that, please? I know all the people online can hear. So hello to all of you and sorry about the delays. We'll give it another minute and then we'll persevere through, I think. So Linda, again, our apologies for this. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us moving, Linda. If you can stay though uh, with us, they might um, they might turn the the screen off. But if you can remain on, and we'll wait till we get a, a cue from them, uh, so we can come back to you uh, at some point throughout the session. We'd really value that if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's persevere. So we've heard a little bit about the positioning, and we've begun to hear a bit about the trends and issues in Byron Shire. I'd like to extend that now across our panel. Uh, John, could we hear from you in relation to the trends? We, we know through uh, both the work that we heard yesterday at the state level, particularly in Sydney, uh, the gar gargantuan effort to move uh, our rough sleeping populations uh, into hotel settings and other forms of emergency uh, accommodation. I can only presume that the City of Sydney uh, played a really critical role, and I think uh, it was even touched on at yesterday's session. Now that we're beginning to move out of that to some extent, what is happening in relation to homelessness in your jurisdiction? Uh, it's interesting, and it was interesting that presentation yesterday, looking at it, um, and how some elements have gone back to a business as usual approach. Um, there we go. Um, I think part of it, especially around 
the issue of non-residents. So in the city of Sydney, um, it's between 70, 17 to 20% of the rough sleeping population are non-residents, so those without residency status. But yes, there was some temporary accommodation during the COVID setting, but that was through advocacy from the city of Sydney, St Vincent's Health, um, Homelessness New South Wales, that really pushed that issue onto the forefront because during the pandemic, that population were on the street um, and it was really noticeable. And um, we, myself and Erin Longbottom, who's in the audience, set up a coordination group to really highlight um, this cohort um, that have, they have no avenues for housing um, and became really apparent during that space. They're still on the street um, and there is no temporary accommodation and there is no pathway for them. And you've got a state um, premier's priority where you, we have to reduce rough sleeping um, by 2025 by 50%. And yet this, grow, this cohort is growing as well. So we work with a lot of mobile voluntary services who provide food in the city of Sydney. And they're saying the amount of access from, and it's not just street sleeping, I should point out, it's also secondary homelessness, um, a lot of couch surfing, a lot of people who don't have residency status uh, accessing these food vans because of food insecurity, job works, um, works dried up, and there is no pathway. And like, it's great that it happened during COVID, but nothing's happening now. And I think that's a really big call to action um, that we need to be, we need to have pathways for everyone. And I think, I think that, that was one of the trends that we noticed. The other one that we noticed and we're noticing more is around boarding houses. And it's a space that no one's really in. And I mentioned it before, especially in Sydney with a lot of the, um, the rain, the persistent extreme weather, um, a lot of boarding houses, there was fires, there was the inner west fire that was sort of unrelated, but related at the same time. We're seeing a lot of boarding houses closed down. Um, we're seeing a lot of boarding houses either being closed for health and building reasons or because the owners are selling up and moving people out. Um, and that's a big trend. There's no real oversight of, of, of it. Um, and it used to be a sort of pathway, I guess, talking about non-residents, for non-residents, they often say you can go into a boarding house. You're paying $220 a week for a boarding house that, I'll put, it, I'll put it in this context, when the police are telling you that there's issues in a boarding house, you know there's big problems. And we're, and we're expecting this group to live there and pay $220 a week. I think, yeah, I think boarding houses and non-residents are probably the two biggest trends that we're seeing at the moment. And the last one, and I'll mention it again, is climate change. Um, we had bushfires and extreme heat in 2019. We had people leaving social housing and sleeping on the streets because it was better than sleeping in their social housing. Um, and now we've got extreme rain. We've got, as Celeste mentioned, we've got you know, housing disappearing and we haven't got a plan for that either and it's going to get worse and I think that's another big call to action another big trend that we need to be focusing on thank you John I'd, I'd like to turn to you now Lauren I know the work uh, of the city of Adelaide uh, and the work of the Adelaide Zero project in particular has a real focus around data data analytics uh, and ensuring that um, all agencies within the city of Adelaide can be abreast the key concerns confronting um, your clients. Could you talk to what you're seeing in Adelaide at present? During the, during the COVID, it was a, um, we were, I guess, in the uh, relatively lucky position that we had, a, we were starting to get quite strong, um, some strong success through the Adelaide Zero Project. We had good relationships. Um, across the sector through that. So um, there was a lot of great work done across that collaboration in terms of getting people into <laughs> hotels and motels and, um, and providing some support there. Um, and you heard Chris um, from Hutt Street Centre talk about that yesterday and some of the outcomes from that too. Um, we post that, uh, the state government also went into a retendering of services, which um, probably caused us a little bit of a disruption in terms of that, that progress with the Adelaide Zero project. Um, we had some people who were quite heavy involved, um, heavily involved in that exit um, the system or take a step back from what they were doing and then um, has come in. But I think in the last 12 months, we've really strengthened uh, that, um, that engagement and, um, and gotten ourselves back on track. So um, in terms of our data, we, we had to get, um, get ourselves back into having quality by name list data um, and, and being able to um, look at that data and be able to um, navigate it uh, 
appropriately. So our most recent numbers uh, suggest that we have, or say that we have um, 186 people currently sleeping rough in the city, although I think that's probably almost due to be updated, right, Rob? Um, and, um, and about 82 people who are temporarily sheltered. So um, we do still count temporarily sheltered um, as an active homeless because that's not a long-term housing outcome. Um, and so we, we're really starting to build that up and being able to interrogate that a little bit more in terms of what next for that group, particularly within new service alliances that we have uh, in the city. I think one of the biggest, I guess, trends or issues and things that we really grapple with in the city uh, in Adelaide is the presence of uh, transient mobile Aboriginal people from remote communities. Uh, that is something that um, a couple, you know, affects different cities in different ways. Um, in, in South Australia, people need to come from remote communities into Adelaide to access healthcare, um, to visit family members who live in Sydney, in, in Sydney, in Adelaide, um, to uh, attend cultural events um, and all of that kind of stuff. A lot of young um, families move down to, to go to school. And we don't really have appropriate, culturally appropriate accommodation in the city for people to be able to stay safely while they're, um, while they're with us. So what that manifests in is overcrowding in suburban areas and also large congregations of people sleeping rough in our parklands and, and in our areas. So I think that's one of those things that, that we really struggle with because our the specialist homelessness sector becomes the net that catches that and needs to be able to provide services, but it's often not the most appropriate way to deliver those services for people. Um, so uh, we have been working quite closely with the Department of Human Services and other state government departments to be able to look at how we look at the safety and the well-being of Aboriginal people from remote communities and, um, and how we can provide better experiences and better safety for them while they're in the city. Um, and that might include helping them to settle in the city if that's what they, them and their families would like or return to um, when that time is right for them as well. So I think um, in trends and things that are coming up, one of our, our biggest concerns at the moment is how we can appropriately support um, Aboriginal people in Adelaide. Thank you. Um, Leanne, I know in your work, particularly through the embarkment on looking at a, a Churchill Fellowship and exploring this uh, more globally, um, I wonder if for a moment you can occupy your, your more parochial part of your mind in, in the work that you do in the city of Brimbank. Um, and again, maybe just for those in the room that aren't particularly familiar with that part of our country, just give us a bit of a sense of where Brimbank sits uh, within Metro Melbourne. economically disadvantaged areas in um, Victoria, in Melbourne, and uh, has a really high uh, diverse diversity in the community as well. So COVID hit Brimbank really hardly. It, um, a lot of essential workers in Brimbank, we had some of the highest death rates from COVID as well. Um, so it was it really had a, a, a great impact on that community that was already um, you know, undergoing and seeing a lot of disadvantage already. And, um, you know, sort of coming back in, we can see that there is an increase in the need for, you know, people looking for housing. There's, you know, higher, higher numbers of people um, coming into the housing services. And as, you know, as we see in most places, you know, there is this difficulty where, you know, a lot of the services sort of, are, are, are sort of congregate in the city and um, the outer parts of you know, metropolitan areas often don't get that level of attention in, in you know, many different ways because it's you know, supply and demand. And I know when we were working in the city, there was all, often this talk about, you know, sort of this, when you put services in there, it's a horrible phrase, I hate the phrase, but this honeypot effect in that, you know, having more services in the central city will bring more people into the central city. and. Um, it's a, it's, it's a consideration when you think, I realise now while I work in an out of central city area, that you know, there is actually very little for people if they are experiencing homelessness in the, in the places where we live, from the housing stock that's available, the types of housing that's available, and also the fact that the service system is just so completely stretched 
and, and, and is not really capable of, uh, of keeping up with, with the demand. Um, I think the other thing that we're really seeing as well out of COVID is um, the COVID really opened the eyes of many people and got allowed people to see into the ways that people were living as well. So like you were saying, John, about the boarding houses and, and other places where people, you know, are technically defined as homeless because of security of tenure. We, we got an opportunity to actually see how people were living and hopefully not unsee that because we actually saw that there was a real need in, in, in places that, uh, you know, in, in places where people lived and we saw firsthand how people were, were living in those situations. So it's really an opportunity there to be able to say, you know, we're going to do something about this. And I really do hope that we are able to keep that, uh, take that opportunity and, um, you know, sort of make some, make some changes. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's been interesting in the Victorian context too, that the high risk accommodation response, which the Victorian government ran in a lot of these sensitive settings, is now some of those, those community, um, the, the community uh, health agencies that were running those programs are now transitioning what they were doing through the Hurrah program into some of these other um, homelessness response services. So I'm really hopeful that through things like the Victorian government's investment into the mental health system, and Brimbank is one of the, um, the first areas that will be getting a large um, mental health um, injection of money from the state government, and also through this sort of transition through, um, through pieces like the Community Connector uh, funding that's going out as well, that there'll be opportunities as well to connect in. So I really do hope that we've got opportunity out of adversity, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can change a few things along the way. Thanks, Leanne. Now, we're just going to pause again. I'm looking at my uh, friends. This is meant to be a comedy show, folks. That's right. Well, um, can we just get an indication from the team up the back? Uh, and, and Linda, whether I know you can hear us, but... Um, I can. I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, okay. Um, jokes aside, welcome, Linda, and again, sincere apologies uh, from our end for the disruption. Um, over to you. Thank you so much. And I can tell you that the online people and I have been having a great time chatting, so uh, apologies for those people in the room and thanks to all the great tech staff behind the scenes who've worked their magic. Uh, I'd like to briefly begin by acknowledging that I'm here today in Sydney, in the City of Sydney, and so pay respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation uh, on whose land I'm on today and uh, acknowledge all their expertise in uh, caring for this land and over many, many centuries uh, and acknowledge our elders past and present and any Indigenous people in the room. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not better at Auslan. I can do a little bit of signing, but otherwise I could have delivered this presentation in that way. It probably would have been more entertaining, but I do want to uh, acknowledge and thank those of you who've just been on the panel. It was a fascinating insight. Uh, obviously, I'm very familiar with the City of Sydney uh, being my own council, but it was great to hear all those uh, different localised stories. And thanks to Ahuri and Homelessness Australia for including this session in this really significant conference and recognising all the work that local government does as underfunded uh, and uncosted as it often is, uh, but as has been already articulated so beautifully uh, by others, when it's on the front line, when we have uh, people uh, coming to our libraries or our town halls or accessing our other services, councils so often do step in to find innovative, creative ways to support this. I know this session is about uh, metropolitan areas in particular, but I do just want to acknowledge that this is an enormous issue in regional areas as well. In New South Wales, the country mayors often talk to me about their enormous concerns with the um, spectrum of housing affordability concerns right through to now for the first time in living memory, people sleeping rough on their streets. So this really is a nationwide problem. Uh, and as we've heard from uh, our friends in Byron, it does have some very significant regional impacts in some areas of Australia. But increasingly, when I speak to mayors, I hear that it is an issue in more and more areas. And I do think it's important to acknowledge that. 
We know homelessness can take many forms. It includes rough sleeping, but also overcrowding, couch surfing, or living in substandard housing. Uh, and as the closest form of government to our communities, so often we are the ones that see the devastating impacts that it has on families and individuals uh, and are called to do something about this directly by our communities. At our recent National General Assembly of Local Government in Canberra, where more than a thousand local government representatives gathered, we had eight motions submitted by councils on the issue of homelessness, calling for uh, more federal funding and support and that's a significant number. It's one of the biggest topics uh, at the forefront of local government minds. So you can see what a significant issue it is for us. There were obviously also many issues relating to many motions on issues relating to affordable housing, mental health and family violence, obviously significant drivers and reasons for homelessness. And it's an issue that I'm personally very passionate about. Uh, I've moved more motions than I can count at the City of Sydney with apologies to my lovely council staff. Uh, and I've been honoured to be able to participate now in the Vinnie's CEO Sleepout for more than a decade. And I can tell you just one night every year sleeping rough uh, is extremely difficult. I don't want to uh, marginalise the impact of people who do it for days or weeks or years. Uh, but I can confidently say that um, with sincere apologies, the people who have to work with me the day after or even a couple of days after I've done the sleep out every year, I always apologise in advance. It's so hard to work. It's so hard to concentrate, uh, even for me after one night. It's unimaginable how difficult it must be for people to gain employment, uh, to live a full life uh, whilst sleeping rough. Uh, and so I just acknowledge the sort of extreme difficulties and the benefits of those housing first approaches to helping people uh, gain their life back. Um, Councils want to help, and I think we've heard that today, and we're all helping in very different ways. Uh, it's not a new issue. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. Each community around Australia, each local government has a different way of supporting our communities. But the reality is for Australians, this problem is getting worse. It's been a tough year for Australians and uh, with the economic changes we're seeing, the changes in particular to inflation and the cost of living, uh, we know that things are objectively uh, getting tougher. Of course, uh, as has been spoken about, we can't ignore the impact of climate change for communities hit by bushfires. And for our new Minister for Local Government, Christy McBain, her community has been hit several times by bushfires, floods, cyclones. Uh, of course, these events destroy thousands of homes, often in communities where there's a very low rate of insurance and the pandemic has cost people jobs and significantly reduced their income. The confluence of all these events has meant that this problem is getting worse much faster. And so there's increasing pressure on local government to step up and do what we can. We're obviously also in, com in combination with these impacts, seeing changed migration patterns. So increasing numbers of Australians moving into regional areas, and that's putting huge upward pressure on rental and house prices in communities. We saw the Mayor of Yurubadala recently write to uh, homeowners in the region to ask them to put their properties up for rent rather than having them on short-term accommodation platforms to support communities to have access to affordable rental property. That's a pretty significant move from a mayor desperate to help. And it's, of course, important to note that uh, housing stress doesn't just affect low income households. In the current environment, we're increasingly seeing middle income households and many key workers, such as nurses and teachers, unable to, uh, certainly unable to purchase homes and for many also unable to pay the increasing costs of housing. We know councils are also reporting that they're unable to attract skilled staff due to housing shortages and unaffordability in their local area. Uh, I know of several councils where they are trying to attract new staff and they literally don't have a place to house these people and therefore they're unable to secure the staff that they need in the jobs. 
Uh, and we know that the responsibility for providing the social and support services generally rests with other levels of government or the community sector. But despite this, again, we're all trying to step in and address the gaps to support our communities. And we do this in different ways. In different ways, how can we find a solution? Well, across the nation, local governments can do many things, identifying land that can be used for social housing, as we have done in the City of Sydney, developing partnerships with community housing providers or service providers. We obviously do an enormous amount of advocacy for our communities to other levels of government and often manage public places, providing such things as storage lockers um, for valuables, facilities to support food uh, and safe and hygienic cooking, and of course, providing free internet and other access and support through our local libraries. Local government also plays an important role in addressing the causes of homelessness. Lots of us are doing work with social inclusion programs, uh, including support to provide assistance for mental health and family violence issues. And thanks to those who've spoken today about those great spe specific examples. Uh, in South Australia, for example, the City of Salisbury has an assistance with care and housing program, which helps those who are specifically at risk of homelessness uh, with appropriate access and sustainable housing. Uh, the Brisbane City Council in Queensland has partnered with the state government to create the Brisbane Housing Company, a not-for-profit company to provide affordable rental accommodation for people on low incomes, directly providing that housing support. In Tasmania, the City of Hobart has established a Housing with Dignity reference group to offer an opportunity for people with a lived experience of homelessness to have a voice and a place to be heard. In WA, the City of Bayswater has developed a local homelessness strategy and implementation plan focused on the prevention of homelessness, the safety of people experiencing homelessness, exiting homelessness and service delivery and advocacy. In the Northern Territory, Catherine Town Council provides an online listing for accommodation and housing services. And we have to remember, as has again already been addressed, in the Northern Territory, homelessness is 12 times the national average, 12 times, a hugely significant problem for particularly remote communities in the Northern Territory. Uh, so we all know that the provision of affordable housing is a key precursor to preventing homelessness. While the provision of affordable housing, again, generally isn't totally a local government responsibility, councils are eager and willing to help and are finding innovative ways to step up to facilitate affordable housing within our communities. Obviously, still though, having to operate within state and territory planning, financial and other legislative requirements. We do things such as uh, planning to ensure there's appropriate supply and mix of housing to meet the community's diverse and changing needs. As many of you would know, we're often in the political debate blamed for a lack of housing supply with respect to the rezoning of our land. However, in almost every council I visit, one of my first questions is to ask them, do you have land that's zoned for housing that remains undeveloped? And I don't think I've met a mayor in Australia who isn't in this situation. Land banking uh, and the delay by people who own land that is zoned for housing remains a significant issue in the provision of the supply of the housing pipeline generally, uh, notwithstanding housing affordability. Uh, we know that local governments do have an important role to ensure planning is there to provide the right supply and the right mix of housing to meet communities diverse and changing needs. But it's ALGA's view backed up by overwhelming evidence that simply increasing housing supply of course does not reduce the price of housing or increase the amount of affordable housing. In many parts of Australia, councils are stepping in to fill gaps and partnering with organisations, often delivering really great impacts. But we think there's an opportunity to do so much more. It's why we've advocated very hard for a new $200 million four-year federal funding program that would directly support councils to develop and implement more innovative housing partnerships. 
of course, many of you would know uh, that the new uh, Education Minister, Jason Clare, was the former local government uh, shadow minister and also the minister responsible for uh, shadow policy development for housing. Uh, so in that capacity, we had many conversations with him about the significant role local government can play. Uh, and we look forward to talking to the new Albanese government uh, about the role that local governments can play if funded properly to support the development of more affordable housing in the right places for our communities. Because let's be frank, if we don't see this greater investment in social and affordable housing from federal and state and territory governments, uh, there is very, very significant problems and financial barriers uh, with what councils can do into the future. There still is no national housing strategy uh, and there's no longer a national dialogue between the three levels of government on housing. So we have and continue to call for a national housing summit as the precursor to the development of a national housing strategy and obviously to have local government as a key voice in that debate. In the lead up to last year's election, we welcome that Labor announced a new National Housing Supply and Affordability Council that would include local government. So we look forward to working with the Commonwealth Government on that. As a sector, of course, we have a role to play. But, uh, and I say this in every single speech, local governments collect just 4% of the national taxation revenue, 4%. And councils are heavily reliant on financial assistance grants, those really significant untied grants from the Commonwealth. These grants have slipped from 1% of national taxation revenue under the Keating government to just 0.55 of a percent today. We urgently need to reverse that slide to continue to provide the services our communities need uh, and hopefully see those revenue streams grow under this Commonwealth Government to ensure that we can start to address homelessness and affordable housing in a more systematic way. We're very eager to be part of the solution. We have great innovative ideas tailored to our local communities uh, and we hope the Federal Government will listen and we'll continue to make the case very strongly to the new Government for increased support for councils to be able to do more. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Councillor uh, Scott. That was wonderful um, overview, stretching right across the country and delving in particular into the complexities uh, in the delivery of affordable housing. Now, I'm not going to direct um, affordable housing questions to my fellow panellists. We're not um, statutory planners. Uh, and, and as much as it is critical to get into the issue of affordable housing supply, it would be unfair of me to pepper our panellists uh, with questions relating to their jurisdictions, planning schemes uh, and the like. Um, but we do want to begin to bring in some audience, audience participation. And I have got a couple of questions um, that have come through on the Q&A app. And I'll start with one of those. Um, it's other than increasing, and I should ask, this is open to all. So, uh, Councillor, if you would like to step in, just throw up your hand. Uh, but I will ask if um, our panellists would just like to nominate who would like to go. Um, so, in, in the increasing the supply of affordable housing is one issue. But what are local governments best placed to deliver in the next three years to reduce rough sleeping in particular? Um, I think with, with the council, we'll, it's, again, it's, it's very difficult to reduce rough sleeping if there isn't a housing pathway. I think the council, that's like, <laughs> It's, and it's interesting, and it's not just affordable housing, it's diverse housing, it's um, supported accommodation. Um, like we're seeing a lot more complex mental health presentations on the street. I think we, everyone experienced some form of mental health distress during lockdown, and it's evident on the people that we're working with on the street, and there isn't a pathway for them, or they're going into a tenancy and it's failing really quickly. So I think it's getting the basics right. It's always talking about innovation and what can we innovate. I think sometimes it's just getting the basics and the fundamentals right. And hopefully with the new federal government, we can do that. 
Um, I think what council can, can provide is that coordination. I think we're on the street, we can coordinate the homelessness services, we can coordinate the different responses, we've got the different touch points where we can identify the trends quickly. Um, when I was at state, you don't see those trends emerging as quickly as you do at local government. And I think that's the big benefit. And we're also, I think local government sometimes seen as that neutral space, we're a bit of that Switzerland. And so I know with my public space liaison officers, they work on the street, they've got case management background, and they manage that public space, but they're not case managers. And so when they're engaging with people sleeping rough, they are seen as that sort of neutral there, you know, that space. And I think that extends to local government. So I think that's the part we can play, but we need a housing pathway. Well, we can, we can shuffle the deck chairs, but we need pathways up. And I think it's a whole of government, whole community sort of action and response around that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, the really uh, clear thing is that we can't do anything alone. Um, we, we need to all, we, we need to we need energy across the sector, within the state government, and, um, and, and work together in terms of how we can address um, rough sleeping. Housing pathways absolutely is the, um, is the key, and certainly uh, in our experience, supportive housing is something that we are very heavily missing. Um, we, we know that there is a proportion of people on our by name list who will require supportive housing probably for the majority of their lives um, and, and we can't provide that. So I think um, it's not just about the people um, uh, off the streets, but also how can we prevent them from coming back in and, um, and how we work with people and work with other um, that's throwing me a little bit, sorry. Um, uh, work with, with our uh, community services to prevent people coming back, in, back onto our streets as well. Um, I do, as, um, as everyone else has said, strongly believe that our biggest role is around um, collaboration with everybody, bringing people together. We sit in that unique position that we have the capacity to do that. But we also uh, have, I think, a a responsibility to build the capacity of our community in their best way. Just move that a bit. To to a solution. So um, you know we always talk about this that we with our residents, and our businesses, and and the impacts that um, rough sleeping has on in their lives or running their businesses. Uh, I think that, that there's actually discussed around um, people complaining or <laughs> uh, we actually can have um, can have a better conversation and have better outcomes with our community. So um, I, I think that that's what we should be doing and um, and the ability to do it. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add to what the others are saying. Obviously, in our experience and environment, we've very much stepped into that collaborative role of bringing people together, and we are seeing the benefits of that for our local community. Um, but I guess there's also a key role of local governments across the nation because, we, as we know, we need the housing options, and we absolutely do not have those in the Byron Shire to be able to move people out of rough sleeping. Um, but when we do have those options, such as the Together Home program that was actually working really well for us, um, when they could find affordable houses to head lease, which were very rare, but anyway, um, being able to provide that housing first pathway with the background supports, it was working. We were seeing people being able to move out of homelessness um, that, we had, that we had been sleeping rough for more than 20 years in the Byron Shire. So that was an incredible win for us. But I also think that we have a really strong role as local government to be able to elevate the, the work that's happening in our local community. There is incredible work happening across the nation in different local contexts really place-based approaches. I mean, what's happening down in Victoria and being able to connect that work up and build on what's working and be able to come together as local governments across the nation and elevate our voices so that people know what's happening on the ground and really leverage our position within government to create change. Thanks, Celeste. Leanne, did you want to add to that? I agree with what everybody said here, but I think just a reflection is that, you know, in sort of getting ready to do my study, I've been talking to a lot of uh, people working in local government overseas, 
And you know, it's quite amazing. You know, the scale can be quite different in places like America, but actually the situation is the same. And collaboration is what everybody says is the thing that local government can do. So, you know, I think that's sort of, you know, we've got the right way there and we just need to be able to keep going at it as well and making sure that we don't give up because sometimes collaboration isn't easy it can be really really difficult so it's about sort of really bringing everybody together and having a common result and a, uh, and, and a goal that we're working towards and, and and really achieving it that way thanks leanne and we're starting to see some wonderful questions come through and i'll do i'll do my best at trying to trying to blend a few of these together um, We'll come to a discussion about the role of the National Housing and Homeless Plan towards the end. And I think in particular, Councillor Scott, we would love to get your views on some of that work, particularly uh, from local government perspective across the country. But let's localise it again for a moment. And uh, we've got a question that's coming through, which is looking at, at NIMBYism. Uh, it's asking the question around the tension points that local governments often confront. And I know in my own hometown of Melbourne, uh, one of the things that certainly gave rise to a dedicated unit to homelessness uh, was just the sheer volume of community correspondence that came through the Lord Mayor's office, that came through customer service. And I'm sure for those that are in the specialist homelessness service system, uh, you're getting a whole lot more as well. So we know that what we see, particularly in inner city areas, are flashpoints. Um, we've seen in Melbourne uh, protests famously on Flinders Street station steps uh, and some shameful reporting through Broad Street media, essentially shaming people for that circumstance. And I know we've seen similar things play out in Adelaide uh, and also in Sydney and no doubt right across the country. Um, but councils play a really critical role in not only the immediate response to these issues, but how the narrative and the addressing more broadly of NIMBYism, particularly when we look to bring homelessness services, supported accommodation developments into inner metro areas. Would the panel like to talk to that issue and what role councils can play in addressing community concern, dispelling myths, and actually setting a narrative that's respectful and provides dignity? I think that uh, the, the, the NIMBYism is a, is a real situation and I think there are some, you know, sort of real challenges because obviously what we know is that counts, councils and mayors in particular can really drive the um, narrative and the way that we work on homelessness and often mayors don't have a lot of, you know, they, ha they have a loud voice but not much, you know, sort of money behind them or, you know, they, but they can, they can own the, the, the conversation and I think... Uh, that, that's a really important thing to be aware of. That you can sort of influence the way that uh, that that we talk about uh, we talk about issues and and, and what we do. Um, I think that uh, you know we we really have a, we have a responsibility in that space as well. So it's sort of you know it is it is really an important piece to be able to bring people together and be able to to, to sort of talk about the, the problems as well as the opportunities that exist. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite interested to hear what others might have to say and might respond after that too, because, uh, yeah, different experiences. I might add, um, just as an individual counsellor, that, you know, I think councils also can play a really great role in finding the right places that communities will be comfortable with for the provision of affordable housing. Uh, in the city of Sydney, you know, we have uh, very different zones of everything from a CBD to heritage conservation areas to very, very high dense uh, apartments. And there are better and worse places for uh, mixed affordable housing. There are better and worse places for, you know, job space versus uh, spaces for housing generally. So, I think it is the case that NIMBYism will always exist, uh, but it is also the case that councils are best placed often to find and plan for uh, where these hubs can be and where uh, wraparound services can be co-located. Uh, and I'll give you a really practical example. So when the um, Labor government were last in power under Kevin Rudd federally uh, in the city of Sydney, they funded a common ground facility. It, now houses about uh, 400 
people uh, with a very supported model of accommodation to uh, provide homes for people transitioning away from homelessness. It allows people to have pets. There's uh, a range of living skills classes. Uh, I certainly calculated when I was first elected to the city now 10 years ago, had there been funding for one more of those facilities in the city of Sydney, we literally would have been able to ensure that nobody was sleeping rough at all. Uh, we found a great location for that in uh, partnership with the state and Commonwealth government. Uh, there were very few community objections to this very, very supported uh, model of accommodation and it continues to thrive today. Uh, what was the barrier? Well, it simply was that there was not enough funding at the time to build one more and to transition people away. Yet during the pandemic, uh, when it was clearly in everybody's public health interest, the state government paid to house all our uh, people sleeping rough in the city of Sydney in very expensive hotels at much more cost. So this really is a matter of priority uh, for state and federal governments. Local governments can provide those place-based solutions to reduce community concern and prevent nimbyism when they've got, you know, great expert skilled staff who are able to plan ahead for those place-based solutions. Um, Lauren, you were going to pick that up as well. There's actually a huge amount of um, respect that, that comes, a level of respect that comes from our community. We, we, there are absolutely tensions and, and pinch points um, and generally though that is tied to where there's antisocial behaviour rather than just the presence of people who are experiencing homelessness. And so um, I think that that has a lot to do um, firstly, with um, with the leadership that our, our current Lord Mayor has made in this space, she's spoken openly um, about about our desire to end homelessness in our city, and um, and also because of the Adelaide Zero Project, I think that it gave us a really um, a really great model that we could communicate to our community about how we are. Um, approaching um, ending homelessness and what we are doing about this and how we are working with everybody that needs to be involved in that. And I, I think that people have respect for that. I think that it, it kind of um, switches a bit of a light bulb on it for people that, yes, this is more complex, that um, that just, you know, we've for years have been applying our regulatory approaches to moving people on or, you know, um, using our bylaws and things like that. And that hasn't, obviously, hasn't... You know, solved anything or resolved anything for anybody. So um, I think that by having something like that where we have data that we can share with people publicly um, and the messaging that we have around that work has really helped to, um, to, to bring the community along with us and, um, and, and be able to, to just keep that conversation really honest and open and, um, and a bit more mature than, than what it might have been previously. Um, and that's not to undermine that there certainly are sections of our community that are experiencing experiencing some some difficult situations, um, and um, and and we try to work really closely with them. But I do think that on a whole, people are quite um, quite mature uh, in in that conversation. Can I add something onto that, Lauren, just on what you were saying, which is also that area of spontaneous giving. Mm -hmm. So I think that in a, on the other side of people saying not in my backyard, there's also the side where people, you know, sort of see the suffering of others and want to come out and help in the very best way they can. And we've often, you know, sort of struggled as well with sort of how we can influence that because um, sometimes, you know, giving out, you know, a hundred blankets or, you know, a hundred swags in the city might have other consequences in that people might not be able to, you know, first of all, sometimes it's clutter and sometimes there's a lot of stuff on the streets. That was one of the things we saw in Melbourne a lot. Um, but then there's also the situation where, you know, if you're just giving things out, then obviously the conversations about, you know, sort of ending homelessness can't happen either. So, you know, sort of trying to play that role of encouraging, you know, sort of 
people to give to services who can then go and work with people and actually work on the long-term needs that people have as opposed to just, um, you know, going in and um, responding to an immediate need. And it was a really difficult conversation to have because it's a really hard one to say, to say to people, don't do that. But, you know, sort of working out how to manage that was a really, for the council, the council really had a role to play in that too. And I know Sydney was very much involved in, in, in doing that too. John, you, you might have a response to that, but we've also got a question uh, in the audience. So uh, we've got about sort of just shy of 15 minutes left. And, and while we are getting some Q&A through the app, I do uh, not want to neglect my duties to open it up to the room itself. So um, do we have a microphone up the back? And we've just got a question to the... Or you can just project. It's up to you. Uh, there you go. Um, um, yeah, look, this has been um, really interesting. I um, am conscious that obviously we've referred, like the, the panel has referred to coordination efforts and the council being a, like having a role in collaborating. And I'm curious about um, what work's kind of going on in terms of collaborating with um, academia and, re and universities, um, particularly, obviously, we're having a conversation about um, interventions for homelessness at the tertiary end, but I'd be really interested to know if there's any kind of research in any space, and particularly in early intervention. So, yeah, thank who would, you. Who would like to have a go at that? Um, yeah, I, can, I can help have a go at this. Um, we do have a... We do have a lot of engagement with universities around research. Um, a good example for that more recently, um, we set up a mobile voluntary services guidelines and that came about um, not directly through university, but through research. Um, we often get approached, um, Hal Pawson from U University of New South Wales around that. Um, we also have grants that we, knowledge exchange grants that we provide as well. So I think it's, and I feel like it's increasing as well, that end, because I think, again, that's that evidence base that helps form policy, helps form guidelines and stuff like that. So yeah. Short answer, yes, we do. Um, Nick. We do too at the peak body level. So when I was the state um, president of New South Wales local government, uh, we initiated a um, research grant that enabled um, academics to come to councils and councils could apply for the research grant. And we would favour these kinds of issues, so issues that had... Uh, you know, the ability to change policy across all local governments, not just one, and we'd favour uh, research projects where there were more councils involved. Uh, and so we ended up focusing um, the uh, winning research grants on things like the circular economy, but also on social policy issues like this, where councils were really keen to engage and understand the evidence. Um, it's a really good way of sort of getting, we found it a really good way of getting councils to focus more on innovation. Uh, often metropolitan councils can afford to do it themselves, like the city of Sydney or Melbourne, but often regional councils can't. So we found that having those peak body grants uh, worked really well to support some of the regional councils to engage. I did it because I used to work at a university, so I'm passionate about research. Uh, but, you know, hopefully other councils can sort of follow that model. Thank you, Councillor Scott. And Leanne, I mean, you're embarking on a, on a scholarship sort of looking at this. No doubt um, part of that is also um, tackling the, the, the discourse and the existing work in the literature on this. What's your experience around uh, research in local government and working uh, with academia? Yeah, there's certainly a lot to learn and, you know, sort of a lot to pull from many different places. I mean, top of mind for me is one, another project that we did hear under the um, assistance of uh, some librarians in San Francisco, where we brought a, we used a social work model to um, bring a social worker into the library into the libraries, and this was City of Melbourne had an assertive outreach program, and uh, we had assertive outreach workers going out and working with people who were sleeping rough on the streets. But uh, we were finding that in the in the libraries, a lot of the librarians who you know were not social workers, they were there to, to for, for other reasons, were feeling that they were seeing a lot of people who were homeless coming into the libraries, and also feeling under pressure with some people who wanted. To 
and others who said this is not my job. So there was a there was a lot of there was a bit of tension there, and also it became an OHNS issue. So we uh, went out to the, we'd found out about these uh, library social workers in the United States and reached out to um, some academics, some um, practicing social workers, some libraries, and we were they were able to really mentor us in being able to bring that system into into Australia. And now there's a whole lot of there's libraries all around Australia and in New Zealand as well who are who are using this model. And what we found was that if you actually engage with people in a library, you often find that people are much more willing to engage with, with people where they feel, in a place where they feel, where it's free, and libraries are some of the only free places left in, in, in cities and towns, um, where, where they feel safe, where they feel welcomed, and also where they feel that they're not going to be, you know, sort of pushed out or have their things taken away or, you know, sort of be reprimanded for, for being in a place. and. Uh, the, the first rounds of our research there really found, and we did some research then with a, a local university to, to document that, what we found was that the actual ability to engage with people, sometimes on the streets, it could take, you know, 60 or so interactions with somebody to, um, to, to make, you know, to, for someone to, to, to trust, build the trust to be able to make some change or to take an offer, whereas people were actually finding in the with the library social worker it was happening much more quickly. So if we can take some of that, that sort of combo, that collaboration between, you know, sort of practical experience and academic knowledge, I think there's a whole lot of opportunities out there. The academics in the room, uh, local governments are open for business. Um, and, and one thing that we did hear uh, through the Council of Capital City Lord Mayor's practice group that we have that meets monthly, um, the discourse is sparse on this issue from an academic perspective. If you look at social service journals, uh, local governments are absent. And, and it's not because the work isn't there and not getting done on the ground, but there's a mismatch in terms of the, the academic inquiry into this and the role that local government can play. We've got a question up the back there, and then we might need to move towards some closing remarks. So I think we've got the option to take that as a comment or a provocation, councillor, for yourself possibly. Um, would you like to have a go at responding to that in relation to, and I think that can kind of begin to get us to a conclusionary remark, uh, in particular in relation to the role around local government and the development of a national housing home. So, I'm so sorry, it's really hard to hear the back no. of the room. So I missed a bit of that question and or comment. Um, but if it's about the National Housing um, Partnership, then, you know, we're very enthusiastic about being involved. Uh, we want to do that in a really inclusive way. And obviously so much of our policy is generated by our conference that I spoke about earlier. Uh, we've advocated for this to happen. We've advocated to the Commonwealth. We were successful in uh, seeing Labor make a commitment. Uh, obviously, it's going to take a lot of work to just um, move the political commitment forward in a, in a constructive way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're hopeful that we'll see some movement uh, after a long period of inaction. And at ALGA, I can tell you I'm personally very committed to moving this issue along so that uh, local governments are better enabled to support our communities to address this really important issue. I'm sorry if that doesn't address the comment. I just couldn't hear all of it. No, look, and that's fine. And look, I, in part, I know we've got one more question with a microphone and then I'll, I'll pull together some closing remarks so uh, you can all get out and off to lunch. So uh, question in the middle there. My question is, uh, John, earlier you raised the fact about um, how the, the, uh, um, the residents 
non-residents are not getting paid and how um, it's very hard to find them accommodation and stuff like that. Do you know if it's been raised with the government? Are the government going to be doing anything about it? They're probably, they're probably sick of myself and Aaron and all the peak bodies raising it. So we had a forum, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago, and we had um, James Toomey was present, um, the, sec the, uh, the dep sec, so he was present at the forum. Um, a bit of a call to action, we had a lived experience panel of seven non-residents, someone who was still homeless, who also spoke, was quite powerful. So yeah, we have been raising it. And I think I raise it at every possible moment. I think a lot of it is around the more that people are aware, they can raise it internally as well. They can raise it at their spaces and just puts increased pressure. So yeah, we have been raising it a lot and we continue to because it's going to be a growing problem. Um, absolutely. And it's a really good comment, and I think the the domestic violence. It's shocking that as a woman um, that is without residency, you're expected to pay for your domestic violence accommodation when you don't have any financial control. Sometimes, and I think the big changes are visa reform, um, changes to the domestic violence uh, for non-residents, and also temporary accommodation and crisis accommodation for non-residents. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're going to turn uh, just to close out today's session and, and I would like to acknowledge that while we do have a lot of unanswered questions on the Q&A app today, I'll be working with my panellists and colleagues at the Council of Capital City Lord Mayors to provide uh, where we can answers to those questions. Um, so some closing remarks from my end. There is an emergent, and I'm going to call it an awakening, and growing appreciation that local government has an invaluable role in the provision of homelessness responses right across Australia. From the need to respond rapidly to the impacts of COVID-19, the displacement caused by climate change disasters, through to the delivery of the preventative work of local youth services and as a backbone for localised service coordination efforts. Beyond this, we're starting to witness the critical leadership role that councils can play in unlocking land, brokering the delivery of affordable housing and using localised planning levers to deliver a range of housing options right across the housing continuum. In my own hometown of Melbourne, we're seeing the development of a special entity, Homes Melbourne, bringing together the often separate portfolios of homelessness and housing and positioning our efforts as a city to catalyse investment into new affordable housing supply while also harnessing our existing role in the delivery of specialist homelessness services to ensure people can access viable housing pathways out of homelessness and sustain their housing. Having had the privilege of chairing the Council of Capital City Lord Mayor's Working Group on Housing and Homelessness for the past three years, I've been buoyed by the generosity uh, and commitment of my colleagues, their willingness to share their practice, challenges, enthusiasm and insights. And I've also learnt this. Local councils have been at the coalface of this issue for a long time. Often without the clarity of a legislative role, and the absence of dedicated funding to support their work. And while every jurisdiction has distinct and unique needs, there is one thing we hold in common. We know our local communities. We are adept at bringing people together. Our communities turn to us when a crisis hits and we're committed to playing our part in the development and delivery of a national housing and homelessness plan, a plan that must seek to end homelessness in this country. Thank you to everyone for your questions and participation, and please join me in thanking Leanne, John, Lauren, Celeste, and Councillor Grant.